title this morning of the message is this. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 15. And the title would be this. There's no new like Jesus knew. Amen? I think you all know that. We can agree with that already. You don't even have to get in the message. But there's no new like Jesus knew. We want new things. We want different things. We want things to be changed. But there's no new like a Jesus knew. So just a quick recap of where we've come in the first two chapters of this. We really have, Paul has really laid out, we, we know the scenario of there's problems in the church at Corinth. Paul's been away for a while. He's gotten some letters. There's been correspondence. There's been visits from others. And there's these reports that come to Paul of the problems. And we've got a lot of problems in this book that we're going to deal with. But he starts with the first, and it's all of these divisions. There's divisions in the church. There's, there's fightings, and the divisions basically are a result of something that he has, Paul has harped on really for two chapters now about the worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. And these are folks that would have, would have been swayed by worldly wisdom. They would have wanted to be with the right people and the right groups and the right cliques. And some of that had come into the church. So there's division in the church. There's problems in the church. There's these divisions and cliques and there's favorites and I like this one and I like that one. And, and there's, there's, so there was not unity within the body of Christ. And that's where we've, uh, you know, Paul, so he's addressing that. He's addressing the worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. He talked about it and he's clearly presented the gospel and the need for the gospel and the, the foundation there to build on. And so now we come here to chapter 3 and really I think in these 15 verses we're going to be able to find some things that we can latch on to to help us, okay? So maybe there's some answers to some of the problems that have been going on. Now we struggle with the old flesh, Amen. We struggle with the old flesh. Just like the Corinthians, we struggle with carnality. And what we need is we need new. We need new every day. When we get up, we need new. We need new every week, every month, every year. We need new. We need to be changed. We have been changed, and we'll look at that, but we need to be renewed, and we need new in our life, and we need to begin to move past this struggle with the flesh and carnality. And when we talk about new, Psalm 40, uh, in Psalm 40, David, King David said in verse 3, he says, he has put a new song in my mouth. He speaks of the Lord and what God had done for him. He says, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. So he's put a new, a new song in David's mouth. In Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah said, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because he, listen to what he says. He says, because his compassions never fail. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. So his compassions are new. He puts a new song in our mouth. His compassions are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. John 13, the Lord tells his followers there. He says, a new commandment I give to you. He gave them a new commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. But this by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So he gave a new commandment to them of how to love one another. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And you're, you're probably familiar with this verse as Paul is talking about the fact that everyone who is born again, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that if right there, if anyone is in Christ, if they are born again, if they are a child of God, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When we get saved, folks, it's not just Jesus additive to our life. It's not just a little seasoning, a little bit there to make it better or, or you know, to bless us in that area. It is all new or it's not at all. If we are in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And then in Revelation 21, the Apostle John gave this testimony. He says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Now, I know that disappoints some of you. Get, get your beach time in now. Because as I read Scripture, there is no sea. On the new earth, there is no sea. We're not going to have a beach. There be, there's, there's no sea there. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Here's, this is a great, great verse. Behold, I make all 
things new. The Lord didn't say I make some things new or most things new. He makes all things new. And he said to me, right, for these words are true and faithful. Nobody does new like the Lord Jesus Christ does new. And today, June 26, 2022, uh, he wants to do new things in our life. He wants to do new things in our lives today. Folks, he doesn't want us to, I'll just say this, he doesn't want us to leave here the same way we came in. He doesn't want that. We shouldn't want that. Our desire every time we gather together, every time we get up and open the Word of God, every time we spend time in prayer, is, Lord, you call me and you draw me and you shape me and you mold me a little bit more like Jesus that I'll be more like Him. He wants to do something new in our lives, but God gives us part in this, okay? Now, I don't know how many times I've said this, but a lot of people want God to work magic. They want God to just work magic. Wave a magic wand and all of a sudden, poof, you're mature. Poof, this is gone. God doesn't work that way. Now, salvation, when he convicts us and we respond through repentance and and confession of our sin and we call on the name of the Lord, he saves us. It's his work, and we are at that point new. But there's responsibility we have, and we're going to look at that this morning. So how do we get past some of these problems that were brought on by carnality, by their childishness that we're going to see. But how do we do that? And how does God do something new? We want to see something new to done today. There's four things we're going to look at. The first is this. Our faith must be in God's foundation. Our faith must be in God's foundation. Verses 10 and 11. Jump down to 10 and 11. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 15, but we're going to start right here at verse 10 and 11. He says, Paul says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation... And another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The only foundation, folks, the only foundation for eternal life is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is it. If anyone tries to build anything else on that foundation, it's going to be, it's going to be messed up. And we, we have to make sure that we are building on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the foundation that we build on. He is solid rock. He's not shifting sand. And that's, that's where it all begins is this foundation of eternal life through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and Him alone. Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The only name, the only name is Jesus Christ. The only name by which we can be saved. The only person we can be saved through is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only foundation. John 3, 17 and 18. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Look, if there was any other way, why would Jesus have come? God would just spend all His time and His energy and all of that and said, all right, there's the way. I'll send you to the way. There's the way over there. You go there. That's it. It's already provided. He didn't do that because there was no way to heaven. There was no way to reconciliation with God but through Jesus Christ. So He sent the Lord Jesus Christ that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is the only foundation. It's the foundation we have to have in our life. Folks, we were, we were enemies of God, and, and our salvation came at the highest price to Jesus. It cost him his life. But praise God, he rose from the dead. He's not with the rest of the false prophets out there, the false religions, that their bones are all in a grave somewhere. His bones are not there because the Lord rose again from the dead. He proved that he was God. He proved that he was who he said he was. He proved that he could do what he said he would do. And so then in Romans 5.10, Paul could say this, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, is the only foundation, the only hope for eternal life, the only way to be reconciled with God, and we must place our faith in Him and Him alone. It starts right there. Our faith must be in God's foundation. That's where it's got to start. Sometimes, folks, there's problems in the church because there's people in the church, and where there's people, there's problems. Amen? It's just a fact. I've heard people say, well, if it weren't for all these people, ministry would be great. That'd be like saying, if it weren't for all those children back there, man, preschool would be awesome. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. So, look, look, it's, um, 
We've got to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes, folks, we have problems in church because of a couple of things here. Number one, if you have a relationship with Christ, are you walking with Christ? Or, or are you walking in the flesh? Are you walking in sin? Are you walking at a guilty distance from the Lord? Are you not in right fellowship with Him? Because if you're not, you're going you're to be a problem. Because that's just what we, that's what we do as people. We, we're like those sheep, right? The Lord used that analogy, but there, there's a reason he uses that because sheep are dumb and we're, we're dumb. And so look, if we're not walking in the Spirit, we're not walking with the Lord close hand in hand, folks, we're going to be a problem and we'll, and we'll get with each other. We'll be like those sheep that are butting heads constantly. And we can do that even when we're walking with the Lord sometimes. We've got to have that right relationship. The other problem we have in church is folks have been deceived or deceiving themselves. Folks that think they're going to heaven or they've rationalized that they're born again and they're truly not. They don't have that foundation of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I challenge you today to question that, to always look at that. Make sure that you are right with God. Make sure your relationship is, is sure and secure. You, th- th- it, 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 you know, you, us Baptists, I've heard this said, oh, you Baptists, y'all in that... Yeah, that once saved, always saved. Yep, I absolutely believe that. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't lose your salvation. But folks, the key to that is the once saved. You have to be born again. You must be born again. And it's through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's that right foundation. And, and so that's where it starts, is that right relationship with him. The second thing here is, is that we must be intentional about spiritual growth. We must be intentional about spiritual growth. You know, if you have, if you plant a seed in a pot and you, you know, it's on your back porch, it doesn't get rain, it doesn't get sun, and you just leave it there. You put the, sun, well, the seeds there. It can do its part now, but you don't water it. You don't, you don't make sure it's getting right sunlight, whatever. You, you're not doing the things that uh, that promote growth of that of that seed. Or you buy a potted plant. You don't do the things to promote its growth. It's going to die. It's going to shrivel up. We must be intentional about spiritual growth. It's not something that just happens. God wants us to grow in our Christian faith, in our Christian life. Amen? He wants us to grow. And there's no doubt about it. Right here in verses 1 through 4 that we're going to look at, Paul was speaking to Christians who were not growing like they should. Verse, verse, uh, verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now, you are still not able. And Paul was saying, look, this is a shame because you ought to be eating steak by now, but you're still on the bottle. You're still struggling, and, and, and I've got to feed you with a bottle, and then I've got to burp you because you're having trouble handling that. He said, I've I got to do these things for you. You ought to be feeding yourself. You ought to be eating on your own, and you ought to be eating the right kind of things. And he's talking spiritually here that you shouldn't be you shouldn't be struggling with the minor things. Now you should be growing. And so, how do we do that? They have not grown, and and they still they're still babes in Christ, and they're still not drinking. Uh, they're still drinking of milk and not eating solid food. And obviously, here God wants us to grow in Christ. That's what he's saying. He wants us to grow. You know, when we're born again, we're born as baby Christians, right? We're not born as mature Christians. And I don't care how old you are, age maturity has nothing to do with spiritual maturity. Amen? I mean, there's 40-year-olds I know that act 14. There are 14-year-olds that act 40. So, you know, your age doesn't even always dictate maturity, but your age chronologically certainly doesn't dictate maturity spiritually. You can be a teenager and be walking close with God and studying the Word and learning and growing as every teenager should be if they're a believer. And they can be much more mature than someone that's been in the faith for 50 years. You get that? So we're born, we're born. So here's the good news. The good news is that as believers, we can grow. We can grow in our faith. We can grow in our walk with the Lord. The problem is that sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't grow. And that was certainly the case here in Corinth. And, 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 and we have to pay attention to our growth because our Christian growth isn't automatic. Oh, I got saved, and now it's, it's like Randy said. Randy said, you know, I've been, a, I've been a believer for 50 years. 
but he wasn't discipled early. He wasn't, he wasn't poured into with the Word of God, and he didn't have that firm foundation under him with the Word of God. And, and, and so he struggled for all those years until four years ago he came to that place where he, man, he gave it all to the Lord, and now he's a student of the Word, and he's growing, and he's being fed from the Word of God. So lack of spiritual growth in our lives, it affects every area of our life. I've been a Christian, you know, say I've been a Christian 20 years, but I'm not walking with the Lord the way I should at 20 years, then, then it affects our lives. It affects us personally, amen? If we're not walking with the Lord the way we should, it affects us personally. It affects our family. It affects our relationships. It affects your attitude and actions, and, and it affects our church. Folks, if you're immature as a believer, there's a good chance you're going to cause problems in the church because you're going to handle things carnally as they were there. You get in the little scuffs and fights about everything because it generally is going to turn to being about me, not about what, this, what the Lord wants or even handling it the way that we should biblically. Now, we have a wonderful church, and, man, I thank God every day for the blessing that it is for us, for my family to serve here. I mean, we, I, I, I consider it a, a great blessing. I had somebody ask me this while we were gone um, while we were up and, and spending some time with family, I had somebody talking to me and, and, and asking, you know, how's things going and stuff. And I told him, I said, you know, I've never been, in, in 22 years of ministry, I've never been as content anywhere as I am right now. Now, contentment and complacency are different things. I'm not complacent. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not complacent with where we are as a church or where I am as a even as a believer, where I am in my walk with God. I'm not complacent, but I'm content. I don't have this, this, this something there going, man, what's out there? Or what's over there? Or what could you do there? No, I don't, I don't have any of that. Now, I was thankful when I came back and y'all had not removed the nameplate from my door. I praise the Lord for that. So um, we're thankful to be here. But folks, we know that no church is perfect, amen, because there's people in it. And where there's people, there's problems. And I'll say this, where there are problems, where there are problems, there are, there are opportunities for biblical solutions. And where there are biblical solutions, then we have opportunities for greater growth. And where we have greater growth, we have more people. And where we have people, we have problems. And where we have problems, we have opportunity for biblical solutions. And where we have biblical solutions, we have opportunities for greater growth. And we have greater growth, we have more people. Do you see where I'm going with that? The more people we have, there's always going to be problems. But the way we handle problems is biblically. We handle it with biblical solutions. And so no church is, per is perfect, and we have to learn from the problems they were having there in Corinth. And, and so it, it's very important because there are dead churches and dying churches all around us. Uh, if I could turn the live stream off, I'd love to share with you in about three minutes what we experienced this past weekend. I mean, it's just, I, it was that. It was a, what I feel like is either a dead church or a dying church. I mean, it just, there was no life there. and There was a lot of people. There was no life. And, and it, it was just, agree? Yeah. All churches have some kind of problems. And uh, so we're going to keep looking at this. One of the problems they had at Corinth, and it's a problem that we're going to have here, one of those problems was poor leadership, okay? So leadership's important. Somebody there at Corinth, somebody was giving poor leadership. And so Paul had to step in. Somebody, listen, somebody was leading those people to split into groups that were fussing and fighting with each other. Somebody was leading that. So the leadership was bad, and then the leadership that was in place maybe wasn't dealing with it the way it needed to be dealt with, and so there were a lot of problems. When you got to go to Paul, who's way over there in Ephesus, and he's got to deal with it through a letter back to them, there was not strong leadership that, with them. And I mention this to you because, look, I, I'm, your, I'm your pastor today for one reason, and that's by the grace of God. God has called us here. He's put us here. And, folks, when he's done with us here, I want to make it evidently just super, super clear because I don't want to hinder anything God would want to do in this place that I'm hanging on to, because to, I like it. It's great here. We love the church. We love the people. But when it's time, when God's done with us, then I want to be gone. I don't want to hang on and create, pre create problems here for you. And, and, and so understand that. I love being here. But uh, I love being your pastor. And it's only by the grace of God that I'm here. And so I say that to say this. Pray. For me. I want you to pray for me. Pray for me as one of, the, one of the leaders in the church. Pray for our elders. Pray for myself. Pray for, for John Egger. Pray for Raymond Harrison. Pray for us 
as the elders of the church. Pray for me as your pastor that will continue to grow. That's the best thing you can do for me. And the best thing you can do for us as a leadership here is pray for us. I promise you we pray for you. Pray for us. It's another problem they have with selfishness. Those people were fussing and fighting. You look again at, at verse 3 and 4. It says, verse 3, 4, For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal? We're still acting fleshly. When we have, these, when we have envy, folks, there's carnality. When I'm jealous of somebody else, I'm jealous of their position or what they get to do or the attention that they get. Um, what, whatever it might be, if there's envy, if there's strife, uh, there's fightings among you, there's tension among you, uh, divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos, or I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? It goes back to James chapter 4 where he says, where, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust, you lust. And do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. Well, well, what do you mean I ask amiss? That you may spend it on your own pleasure. So he says you don't have because you don't ask. And when you do ask, you're not having because you're asking for the wrong reasons. You're asking because you want it for yourself. You want what you want. It's, it's the, the whole thing I always talk about with Jordan. You know, I want what I want. And we pray to God and we ask, we want what we want instead of what God wants. So there it is in verse 4. You know, Paul goes back to something that he said in chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 10 through 12, he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, look at what they say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. And it's clear what the problem was here. It wasn't Paul who had the I problem. It was the church who had the I problem. Because everything was I, 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 I. It's all about me. So we clearly see what the problem was. It's their eye problem. And the people there, um, you know, they just thought that church was all about me. It's all about me. Whatever goes on, it's all about me. Well, why didn't I get asked to do that? Or why didn't I do that? Or why wasn't I allowed to do it? Why do you not let me do that? Why can't we do it that way? I want to do it that way. That's the way I always wanted to do it. That's why we always did it in my church before. Why don't we, why don't we, me, 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 me. That's the problem they had, and that is a flesh problem. The problem was selfishness, pure and simple. It was just about each one focused on what they wanted. Church, we we have I'm sure we want to. I'm sure in our own hearts we want to. We need to, and God wants us to grow out of that. Amen? He doesn't want us there. First, uh, 2 Peter 3.18, Paul challenges us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God always wants to do new things in our life, but we have to do our part. Amen? Yo, I don't understand that. Well, let me help you understand this. So years ago, Gina, you may remember this story. Years ago, we, we used to do VBS, but it wasn't called VBS, and it really, well, it really was nothing like VBS. They, they said it was their version of VBS. But our church, where I first was on staff, we did a thing called Bible Time. And it was supposed to be like amped up version of VBS. But what happened was it was amped up version of VBS, and it started with our nursery, and it went all the way through high school. We had, we had tents set up for high school. We had a tent set up for middle, middle school. We had a tent set up for elementary school. And we had a service in each of those. We had 700, 750 people on campus. And... Uh, I'll never, I'll never forget this. So we had a kid one night. We, we have the, the teen service, the high school. I was serving with the high school, you know, volunteering in that part. I was on staff, but I was working with the high school. And so we're, we're, um, we're, we're out there, and a kid comes forward. We have the invitation. A kid comes forward, and, and, and I, I get with him. And, I, and so we were out on the ball field. We go out in the ball field out there and, and just sat down and talked. And I asked this young man. He's probably 13, 14 years old. And I asked him, I said, well, why did you come forward? He said, well, well, I, listen, he said, I, I, um, I came forward earlier in the week, and I, I had one of, you, one of y'all prayed for me, and it didn't work. 
I said, it didn't work. I said, well, well, what did you have them pray about? He says, well, I asked, them, I asked them to pray for me that I would stop smoking. And I said, really? I said, well, so you're still smoking? He went, yeah. I said, oh, so, okay, so they, they prayed, but you're still, so can I ask you a few questions? Help me understand this. He, and, and so I said, um, I said, oh, well, let me ask you this. Uh, where did you get the cigarettes? He said, well, well, I got somebody to go buy them for me. I said, okay. I said, well, who paid for them? He said, well, I did. I said, well, who opened the pack? I did. I said, well, who took the cigarette out of the pack? Now, remember, now, remember he's like 14, and, and at this point, he's starting to look at me funny, like, why are you asking? What are you, what are you getting at? And I said, so who took the cigarette out of the pack? He said, well, I did. I said, well, who put the cigarette in your mouth? He said, I did. I said, well, who lit it? I did. I said, so you're upset because someone prayed for you to stop smoking, but you sent someone to the store with your money to buy you cigarettes. You opened the pack. You pulled the cigarette out. You put it in your mouth. You lit it, and you smoked it. I said, how can you be upset with what someone prayed? I said, God will help you with this when you want to quit. Here's the problem, though. What he wanted was magic. He wanted magic. He, he wanted God to take away the desire for the cigarette and to slap it out of his hand. Honestly, I don't think he really wanted that at all. He didn't, he didn't want to do anything. He didn't want to make any changes, make any effort, give anything up. But he wanted, he said, to stop smoking. And so I have in my head this meme. You know what I'm talking about, the hand over your face, shaking my head. But he was critical of those who prayed for him because they didn't. their prayer wasn't good enough. Folks, that's what happens a lot of times with us as believers. We know something's not right, but we want God to just take it away. We don't want to make a decision to give something up. We, we don't want to make that change in our life. I like that. I like it. I don't want to give it up. My dad, my dad was an alcoholic his whole life, and I remember my dad telling me, he said, I can quit any time I want to. I said, well, yeah, you, probably, you, you, you might could. I said, but the problem is you don't want to. And then later on he'd tell me, well, I can't. I've tried to quit. I said, wrong. I said, you haven't wanted to, and you haven't tried. I said, and my dad professed to be a believer, and if he, is a, if he was a believer, and I told him this. I said, Dad, if you are a believer and you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, when you want to quit that, the Holy Spirit of God will help you quit that. He'll give you the power you need to quit that. But you've got to make some effort in this. You've got to want to stop. He didn't want to. That's where a lot of us are today. We have to get intentional about spiritual growth. It doesn't just happen, folks. It doesn't just happen. Spend time with God daily um, through His Word. Look, it's His love letter to us. Get in His Word and through prayer and through meditation on Him, just thinking about God dwelling on Him. As Pastor Aaron pointed us to those lyrics this morning, and we should meditate on that and what God's done for us. Maybe you get a song in your head, How Great There Are. I love that. That's one of my favorites too, Sherry. In fact, I preached a week at camp, and I had, a, I had a, these two girls sing that song every night because I wanted those kids. That song is so powerful. I wanted those kids to hear that, and we sang that every night. And, and by the end of the week, they were screaming it out because they'd learned the song and they were embracing what it meant. But we, we can, through meditation, through worship, through praising Him, through song, through fellowshipping with others, His other children. You know, th this coming together, this is important. What we're doing right here is important. This being under the Word of God corporately is important. This worshiping together is important. This fellowshipping together is important. It's important for our growth we got to do this. So we have to be very intentional about growing in our faith. Number three, we have to seek opportunities to partner with God. Um, Paul talks a little bit here about the great privilege that it is to work with him. And that's what we're doing. Verses 5 through 9, look at this. He says, who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers? They're servants. They're diakonos. They're servants. They're ministers through whom you believed. So he's saying, look, me, Paul, 
Apollos, we're just servants of God. We're just ministers of the Lord. And, and, and we're just servants of Him that through our ministry you believed. You placed your faith in Christ as the Lord gave to each one. Paul says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So who's important in that? God is, God's doing the work, right? But who else is important in that? We are. It's not that we're making these things happen, but God uses Paul, God uses Apollos, he works through them to do what only God can do, and that is to save souls. Well, we're a part of that. He's talking about the privilege it is to be a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. Miss Linda, you go out there to the, the nursing home and you minister to those people there. That's important. But anything that's going to happen in their life, here's what I know. If you don't go, it may not happen. Right? But you go and you faithfully go and you, you speak the truth and you share the Word of God with them, but it is God that uses your ministry in their hearts, and it is God who does the work. But we have to do our part. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one. They're individuals. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. New King James says fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Now, church, we are God's fellow workers. Or as I like the way the King James says it here, we are laborers together. We are laborers together together with God. You know what that means? It means that we're a part of the greatest team in the history of the world. We get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of that. People think it's such a great thing to serve for some presidential administration or whatever. Ugh, you can have all that. I don't want no part of that. I'm part of the greatest team. I'm a part of this. We're, we're on the same team as Paul and Apollos. We're on the same team with the greatest men and women who have ever lived. Men and women who served God, who loved God, many who died for the Lord, many who did great things for the Lord. We're on that same team with them. But best of all, we are laborers together with God. That's the great part about this. We're on His team. And it's extremely important that we do our part. Now, back in verse 6, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now, what, what, God, what good is it for, for Paul to plant if Apollos isn't going to water? We all got to do our part. And what good for Apollos to water if Paul never planted? There's no seed there. Paul, Apollos comes along, and he's putting water, and he's putting water, and there's nothing growing. I don't understand this. I'm watering, I'm watering. Nothing's happening. Well, if the seed has to be sown, somebody's got to sow it. Somebody's got to water it. Amen? we got a part to play. We all have a part to play. And there are many opportunities for us to serve the Lord. There are many. Find out what the Lord wants you to do because it's extremely important for each and every one of us to do our part. That's part of how we grow. One of the greatest opportunities for us to grow spiritually is through service. Go work in that preschool. You'll grow in patience. Amen? Or you'll die in patience, one or the other. <laughs> Um, I had little kids. I, I learned with my own too that that's not my place back there. That's not my place. But if I have to, if I have to, I'll go watch little kids. If that's what we need, and I'm the only one, and I'm, you're stuck with me because somebody else isn't going to step up that that really is their area, then if that's what it takes, I'll do that. We didn't kill one of them when we kept them during the ladies' Bible study. There were about five of us. Jay was a part of that. Jay was awesome. It was awesome with those kids. Dave Stewart was in there. Randy was in there taking care of those kids. They made it through. I was more worried about me than I was them. I knew they'd make it through. I was worried about me. Look, when we serve, it's a part of how we grow. It's a very, very important part. It, it, it is a key ingredient in the recipe for spiritual growth is service. So serve in the church. Serve outside the church. Serve at your workplace, serve in your community, serve in your neighborhood. Whenever, wherever, wherever you are, serve. Find a way to serve the Lord. So Paul was talking here about souls saved and lives changed by the good news about Jesus. And Paul talked about rewards again down in verses 12 through 14. Um, 
I just jumped over the, the heading there. I just jumped over, or just jumped right over it. So that wraps that up. Verse number four is this, is stay focused on the future. That wasn't going to make any sense. You're going to go, where'd you go with that? So stay focused, number four, stay focused on the future, okay? So that's where we want to be. So verse eight of this, uh, right here, verse eight says, now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So again, Paul's talking about souls, talking about souls that are saved, lives that are changed by the good news of the gospel that's being preached. And Paul talked about rewards again then there in verses 12 through 14. So if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, hay, uh, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, the day, capital D. It's that day. It's the day of judgment. It's the day of the Lord. We'll declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. So the Lord talks about Paul's writing here, and the fact is, folks, if we serve God, if we're faithful to serving God, he doesn't say if you're, if, if you're super, super successful. He doesn't say that. He's, he's talking about being faithful. He's just talking about serving the Lord, serving and building on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just going out and doing what God's called us to do and sharing Him with everyone we meet. That The work that we do, He knows our motives. He knows why we do it. We know He knows all these things. And the day will come where by fire it'll be revealed because everything that is not done for the Lord, not done for the right reasons, it's going to burn away. All that will be left is what we did for the Lord and that, that that endures. And then... He will receive a reward for the things that have been done for Christ. So God is going to give great rewards to every Christian who builds on that foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, remember, Jesus is the foundation of our salvation. Amen? So, so look at verse 15. He says, if anyone's work is burned, if anyone's work is burned, example there, it, it, so any Christian's work is burned, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer Loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you have a personal relationship with him, then you are saved, okay? You're going to heaven, and no one can take that away from you. You have that. But we're talking here about your service to the Lord. There are rewards that God will give out. We should, we should look to that. I don't know about you, but as a believer, that, that excites me. Because here's why it excites me. When we stand, by, and we've been, we're, we're learning this in, in, uh, in our study in Revelation on Wednesday nights, but we see the elders that when the Lord is worshipped, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The elders, the 24 elders get up and they take their crown. And what do they do with that crown? They cast it at his feet. Now, I don't know about you, but I want something to worship the Lord with. I want something to give back to him, to cast at him in worship and adoration to him. I don't want to be up there going, oh, man. You know, everybody looking at you, well, you don't have nothing? You know, I want to have something to cast. How about you? We, I, I mean, here's what, here's what us materialistic people do. I can't wait to get my crown in heaven. Walk around with my big crown, all the jewels in it. It's going to look so good. No, 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 no. You got the whole wrong idea of that crown. You got the whole wrong idea of the rewards that God's going to give us. It's so that we have something then to offer back to him in worship and adoration and praise. And, and that's a great thing. It's great to have that reward to give him to worship. But you know what the greatest reward will be? It'll just be seeing Jesus face to face. Amen? There's a story I read. And I'm going to be wrapping up here. Pastor Aaron, you guys can make your way forward. So I read this story this past week about a, a, about a 90-year-old man who went up to his pastor one day after the worship service. And this old man had been blind from birth. And he told the pastor he wanted to see him. Now, you know what that means. If someone's blind and they want to see you, they get, they've got to put their fingers, they can put their hands on your face and they can see you. And he wanted to see the pastor. And so he did. And he put his fingers and he ran his fingers across the pastor's face, and so he could see him, and he began to cry. And the old man said, when I open my eyes in heaven for the very first time, you know who I will be looking at, don't you? And the pastor replied, yes, you'll be looking at Jesus. Then the blind man said, with joy, he said, pastor, it is worth being blind for 90 years to know that the first time I open my eyes, I will be looking at Jesus. Isn't that incredible? 
He understood instead of whining and complaining about being born blind and never being able to see, he's focused on the fact that, you know what, the very, the very first time that these eyes will ever see, I'm going to see Jesus' face. He understood that reward. And, and man, what a reward Jesus is. Amen? It's a great, great reward. Listen, nobody does new like Jesus does new. But Christians, we need to get intentional about spiritual growth. It doesn't just happen. You got to be intentional. Get in the Word, spend time in prayer, fellowship with the right people, do the right things, be the right places. Be in church, all these things, they're, they're part of that. you got to be intentional. Find more ways to work together with God. We are on His team. We're, we're not saved to sit, folks. We're saved to serve. And He wants us to grow through these service opportunities that He gives us all around. Stay focused on our future. Keep a, an eternal perspective. Always have your eyes on the future. Everything here is temporal. Everything here, it, it will be gone one day. Everything. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's it. That's all that's going to matter. Keep your mind, your eyes, your heart set on the eternal. The reward of being with Jesus. And that's the reward, is being with Him. The reward that He'll give us so that we can cast it back at His feet and worship that's why we serve. We serve because I want to be faithful to Him. I want to grow. I want to be obedient to what He's told me to do. So Christian, we've got to do all those things. This morning, if you're not a believer, if you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need, to, you need to start with that today. You need to deal with that situation today. You need to, you need to come to that place of understanding your lostness your sinfulness, that sin that has separated you from God, you need to come confess that sin. Acknowledge that there's nothing you can do. And it's only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Come confess your sin. Repent of your sin. Confess your sin. And, and call on the name of the Lord by faith. Put your faith in Jesus today. Put your faith in what He did for you on that cross. It's where it starts. For each one of us as believers, that's our foundation that we stand on every day. Nothing else. I'm going to ask you if you would stand. Stand with us. We'll have just a moment. And Pastor Aaron's going to lead us in a song. And This, this altar's open this morning. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, I invite you to step out. Come down here. Let's take the Word of God and introduce you to the Lord. Maybe this is a morning, though, that you go, you know what, I... I, I want to be more intentional about my relationship with him. I want to be more intentional about my growth. I want to make a commitment this morning. Maybe it's something you want to come and confess. This altar's open. Listen, I was, I've said this before. In this time of the service, this is time for us to be still. This is time for us to pray. If you don't have anything to come talk to the Lord about, you, you stay right where you are and you bow your head and you pray for your neighbor. You pray for those around you. Because I promise you there's someone in here this morning that, that needs prayer. Someone that needs to spend some time with God. Someone's got something going on in their life. They need, they need a touch from the Lord this morning. This altar's open. And I want you to not be concerned with who's sitting next to you or in front of you or behind you. This is a time for you to focus on you and God. Where are you with him? What do you need this morning? Do you need to come talk to him? you need to come spend a little time at the altar talking to him? And you go, well, I can pray right here. You can. Been in church a long time. There's something about moving and responding in, in, in that way of coming to an altar and talking to the Lord. There's something in that that's different than I'll deal with it later. It's different than I'll just talk right here. The Lord's calling you. Maybe you need prayer this morning. Come down and grab one of us, myself or Miss Gina or Rusty. Anyway, we've got plenty of folks who can pray with you this morning if you need prayer. Father, I just pray you'll move in this time of, of invitation. Father, you know our hearts. You know the needs in our lives. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would just speak to us right now. Lord, may we, may we just put aside pride and concern and thinking about what somebody might think. 
doesn't matter what anybody thinks. Lord, may we just may we just want to get close to you, closer to you, closer to you. So, Lord, speak to our hearts and help us to be obedient, to respond to whatever the leading is that you're, whatever it is you're leading for us to do this morning. How you want us to respond, may we do that by faith right now. In Jesus' name.